It's home to thousands of original police records from the Ripper case. It's incredible. And Ed's found just what he needs, a key piece of evidence overlooked in the original inquiry. This document appears to be creating an offender profile. Dr. Thomas Bond, Britain's top police surgeon, believed he could get to know killers through the corpses they left behind. He examined all the Ripper's victims and wrote a profile that's a century ahead of its time. You think of offender profile, you think CSI, FBI, all that crazy stuff. You don't think 120 years in the past that somebody was actually doing it. So it's really important to see what he saw and how he was able to paint a picture of Jack the Ripper for us. Bond's report describes the murderer's technique in grim and precise detail. He cut the throats quickly from left to right. His knife was straight, very sharp, and at least six inches long with a pointed tip. There's no evidence of struggle from any of the victims because the attacks were so sudden and lethal. His wounds come from a single angle. The killer acted alone. Bond describes a monster, outwardly respectable, unassuming, and neatly attired, inwardly a brooding, vengeful maniac. Ed now has a very clear profile of the killer. He sounds typical of serial killers of today. To me, he sounds like the kind of guy that would get along in society pretty much, you know, every day, but capable of terrible things once that button was pushed. Now, Ed knows the kind of man he's looking for and has a plan to find him. I want to take the Bond report, which is a great tool. I want to take the, the characteristics and the traits he gives us that went unused, unfortunately. I want to take those and use them to narrow down the list of suspects who could have gone to America. It's time for Ed to shorten his list. Severin Klosowski. Although he's a killer and he's put to death for it, he kills his wives by poisoning. Poisoning your spouse is a totally different thing than cutting the throat of a stranger and then taking out the organs. So the, the gap between Klosowski and the Jack the Ripper killings is enormous. Francis Tumblety. I don't like Tumblety. He had no violent history. He certainly had no violence toward women anywhere in his record. I just don't get it. And then you couple that with the fact he's enormous. He's very tall for that time in history. He's got an enormous mustache. He's a crack doctor. He's a character. He's somebody that really, really sticks out. So certainly not someone's going to blend into society. So this guy ain't your guy. That leaves James Kelly. As a young man, he escaped from a lunatic asylum and was a named suspect in the Ripper inquiries. A light bulb goes off to somebody because right after Mary Kelly's murder, very shortly thereafter, the police go out looking for Kelly. So that tells you something. Somebody was looking at this guy very hard. Before the police get close, Kelly flees and they lose interest. But that's not good enough for Ed. Kelly is now his prime suspect, but Ed knows there's a long haul ahead. I'm interested in Kelly. I gotta know more. What was his mental state? Was there any medical reports about his, his mental capacity? Could he be a serial killer? And did he go to New York to kill Carrie Brown? Is this the face of Jack the Ripper? Cold case detective Ed Norris is tracking Jack the Ripper across two continents. Could he be on the verge of solving the world's most famous cold case? He now has a name for his prime suspect. James Kelly, convicted killer, psychiatric patient, escape artist. He is a man with a vicious past. In 1883, less than a month into his marriage, Kelly argues with his wife, accusing her of having an affair, and then plunges a knife into her neck. To track his suspect, Ed travels to Kelly's last known address, the Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum outside London, home to Britain's most dangerous criminals. Kelly's in Broadmoor for killing. You know he's a killer. He's killed his wife. So I know some. I need to know more. What kind of state of mind did he have? Does he have the capacity to be a serial killer? And beyond that, where was he? I know he's on the run, but where exactly? Here, Kelly's psychiatric report has been sealed for over 125 years. 
But now, Ed has unique access. I couldn't tell you how excited I am because his Broadmoor file is extremely important to this investigation. The documents revealed that Kelly was sentenced to hang, but then events took a crucial turn. His boss came forward with new evidence about Kelly's disturbed state of mind. When I arrived, I found him lying on a couch. When I spoke to him, he scarcely seemed to understand what I said to him and complained of great pains to his head. He would drop his tools and begin muttering to himself as though his mind was wandering. In fact, he seemed to me that he had completely lost the use of his mental faculties. A doctor decides Kelly is insane, and he's sent to the Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum. The psychological report was amazing. If you look at what the doctor said about him, he was capable of fits of explosive rage without much provocation. He sounds typical of serial killers of today, where people actually function in society, but do awful things when they're actually killing people. So to me, he fits. I like Kelly. He's, he's got a lot of things to like as a suspect. In the asylum, Kelly is a model patient, playing his violin and working in the carpentry shop. But privately, he's a man obsessed with a secret plan. One of the most interesting things I find out about Kelly is the way he actually escapes. He didn't just jump a fence or run a laundry bag. This guy took a piece of metal and fashions a key that allows him to escape. So it tells me, if nothing else, this guy's no dope. He's very cunning, and he planned this escape for a long time. Though every cop in Britain is looking for him, Kelly disappears for the next 40 years. Then, in 1927, an aging James Kelly appears at the door of the Broadmoor Asylum. The obvious question is, What's Kelly been doing for the past 40 years? You know what? He answers that question himself. A record of Kelly's extraordinary confession survives in the archive. Ed Norris is the first detective to investigate it. It describes a man deeply uncomfortable with society. I can't explain this, but I know that it could not click on with most people in the outside world. I had to contend with all the time with envy, jealousy, and malice. The kind of thing has become hard because of all kinds of skank. It refers basically to uh, women of low moral character, be a prostitute or, or the like. He says, you know, been been on the warpath since I left Broadmoor Island. And the word warpath to me speaks volumes about what he's doing. He's paranoid, he's got delusions. He's already killed somebody. He's confined to a mental hospital, but is cunning enough to escape. He sounds like, you know, a real classic example of your serial killer. Then Ed finds a small but critical detail. Kelly's job. I learn in the case file that Kelly is an upholsterer. To Ed, this reveals a vital piece of the puzzle. The murder weapon. Oh, my father was a butcher. <laughs> he sharpened our knives every day in the house. The knives have to be sharp, so they cut through quickly and save time. Right. And with these, this is something that will be used at that era? Yeah, these are probably about the right sort of time. If they've got a nice long curved blade which will aid slashing away the fabrics. If you're an upholsterer, you're going to be good with a knife. You're going to be strong. You're going to know how to use this tool, and you can certainly use it as a weapon. As an upholsterer, James Kelly did to furniture what Jack the Ripper did to his victims. Ed's closing in on his suspect, and Kelly's confession contains one more secret. He admits after his escape, he goes to London. It's 1888, the year of the Ripper. I think this guy is great for Jack the Ripper. You have a guy that's committed a murder with a knife by killing his own wife, by cutting her throat, and he tells us that he goes to London, which is perfect because it's just in time for the beginning of the Ripper killings. Immediately, there's a spate of attacks on women. Annie Millwood, stabbed repeatedly. Ada Wilson, slashed in the throat. Martha Tabram, stabbed 23 times. It's as if the guy is learning a 